Hi, I'm Ilya Zaitsev, and in this segment, I'm going to show you how Falcon Host can help protect you against even the most sophisticated malware-free intrusions. So if we look at the threat landscape today, studies have shown that only about 40% of intrusions today involve traditional malware. That leaves us with another 60% that we're going to categorize as malware-free intrusions. What do those look like? Typically, these intrusions involve taking a legitimate process that comes with the operating system that we expect to be good and hijacking it in some way and causing it to do nefarious things. One way might be to inject some malicious code into it and take control of that process. Let's take a look at how some of these legacy technologies on the market today attempt to deal with these malware-free intrusions. So first we've got antivirus, which is really just designed to look for signatures of known malware. Of course, in our situation today, there's no malware to look for. It's nothing for AB to pick up on. Whitelisting is another approach that tries to make a list of all good processes on a machine and prevents unknown processes from executing. The problem is we're only relying on built-in operating system executables, and if we try to stop those from running, we might crash the operating system. Indicators of compromise, or IOCs, are really not that much different from conventional AV signatures. We're still looking for known malicious artifacts left behind by an attacker. Of course, by leveraging legitimate processes and operating inside memory, we can avoid leaving those artifacts behind. Another approach involves sandboxing, and that could take many forms, including network-based detonation and micro-virtualization. Because of the performance limitations inherent with sandbox technologies, we're still typically relying on some sort of whitelisting capability to try to decide what we put in the sandbox and what we allow to execute normally. Now, because we're usually dealing with hijacked legitimate processes, most sandboxes are going to ignore them. Mathematical-based techniques attempt to dynamically analyze unknown files and classify them as good or bad. But again, in our situation today, we're not dealing with unknown files, rather good files that have gone bad. So let's see what one of these malware-free intrusions look like in a live demonstration. To demonstrate a malware-free intrusion, I've set up a Windows virtual machine running the Microsoft IIS web server and a SQL server database. The web server is hosting a very simple page that consists of a couple input forms and a submission button. Now, the first thing I need to do is get my web shell onto the server. And I can do that via SQL injection attack. Because the website did not properly check for escape characters, I'm able to echo a web shell onto the web server. This web shell is particularly short and is known as the China Chopper web shell. It's only 72 characters and consists of a JavaScript command executing evals. When I hit the post button, we can see that the web shell has now been injected onto the server. Now I can interact with the web server using the Chopper GUI. This GUI allows me to get a virtual terminal that allows me to run arbitrary commands against the web server. Now that I have remote access to the web server, I can steal credentials. I can do this by executing an encoded PowerShell command. When decoded, this command causes PowerShell to download a script from a remote server, load it into memory, and execute it. This script in turn dumps credentials by injecting into the LSAS process and stealing all the plain text passwords that are cached on this machine's memory. In a few seconds, we can see the output, including multiple usernames and passwords for all the accounts on the system. Now I want to achieve persistence on the server in case my web shell is detected and deleted. To do this without requiring any malware, all I need to do is modify a single line in the Windows registry. I'm going to take the on-screen keyboard process that comes with Windows and set it into a debugger mode. Now what this allows me to do is if I ever want access back into our web server, even if my web shell has been detected and deleted and all the stolen credentials have been disabled, I can get back in anytime I want just by opening up a remote desktop connection to that server. Only instead of attempting to log in, I'll bring up the on-screen keyboard. And we'll see here that instead of a keyboard, we have a command prompt with NT system authority. Not only does this give me elevated privileges, but it doesn't generate a logon event in the Windows event history. Now let's see what all this activity looks like inside Falcon Host. We see that we've generated two different detections on our IS web server. The first one involves suspicious activity. If we drill into the detection, we can see all the details. 
In this case, we've had several different indicators of attack that have been triggered by this malware-free intrusion. The first thing I can see here is that an indicator of attack has been triggered because the IS worker process was spawned by the command prompt, which lets me know that, in fact, I have a web shell operating on my web server. As we can also see, there are other indicators of attack that have been triggered as well. So what did this intrusion look like to Falcon Host? Well, Falcon Host is able to track every piece of behavior associated with this attack. After the web shell is injected into the web server, the worker process spawns a command prompt. From there, the command prompt executes PowerShell, downloads a script, loads it into memory, and injects into the LSAS system process, which from there allows the attacker to dump credentials from the system. Separately, the command prompt modifies the registry in such a manner that allows the attacker to bypass Windows login security. To do that, our attacker creates a remote desktop connection to the victim system, uses the utility manager to bring up the on-screen keyboard, and from there, the attacker is able to get a command prompt with local system privileges. Notice how this entire sequence of events does not require the attacker to write any malicious code to our system, which means it would be impossible to detect with a traditional malware-based approach. However, Falcon Host can still detect this intrusion several different ways using a variety of indicators of attack. Let's start with the web shell. As soon as Falcon sees the worker process spawning a command prompt, that in and of itself is enough to behaviorally tell us that a web shell has been deployed to our web server. Next, when Falcon sees PowerShell injecting to LSAS to steal credentials, we get our second indicator of attack. Our third indicator of attack is triggered when Falcon detects the registry being modified in such a manner to bypass login security. And finally, when the adversary attempts to use that login bypass to cause the on-screen keyboard to spawn a command prompt, that triggers our fourth and final indicator of attack. These are just four examples out of the hundreds of different IOAs that Falcon Host can use to detect malware-free attacks. So I've just shown you a few examples of some very sophisticated malware-free intrusion techniques that we're seeing in the wild today. Now, if we go back to our response timeline, most organizations are unable to detect or stop these breaches because they're relying on legacy technology that focuses just on the malware. Only through the use of Falcon Host indicator of attack technique can you successfully detect as well as prevent these attacks from occurring in the first place? To learn more about IOA-based detection and prevention, please come check us out at CrowdStrike.com.